Hello everyone. In chapter 8, we're going to talk a little bit more about inventory and the recording of inventory when we buy it as well as when we sell it. So the first thing I wanted to show you is basically the definition of inventory is very important. What is inventory? Basically, the, the best way to put inventory is goods that we are purchasing from our vendors to resell to our customers. And the whole idea is to buy it from our vendors for a cheaper price than we sell it to our customers. So that's what inventory is. It's merchandise that we buy from our vendors to sell to our customers. Inventory is an asset and we will show it on the balance sheet. You can see that as we buy the inventory, we're gonna record it as an asset. And then ultimately, when we sell this inventory to our customers, that asset becomes an expense. That expense is called cost of goods sold. And you can see on the far right of your particular slide, you can see the cost of goods sold is in a separate section all by itself. It's subtracted from revenue to get a subtotal called gross profit. Sometimes you'll hear the term gross margin subtract out all of our other selling and administrative expenses to ultimately calculate net income. So that's the flow of costs. There are two ways that inventory flows could work. The first way is called a perpetual inventory system. And with a perpetual inventory system, basically this means that that balance sheet account called inventory gets increased or decreased every time there is physical movement of inventory. So as an example, when we buy inventory, we will debit that asset account to increase it and we will credit the accounts payable. And ultimately, when we sell that inventory to our customers, the simple journal entry is to debit the cost of goods sold once, once again, that's just a fancy way of saying inventory expense, and we will reduce the inventory with a credit. So as you can see, the inventory balance sheet account will be increased or decreased as the physical movement of inventory increases or decreases. It is parallel, as your slide says, it's parallel to the flow of costs. Okay, now, a good question is, which items did we actually sell? If you think about it, sometimes when we buy inventory items from our vendors, the price fluctuates. The prices could be increasing, they could be decreasing, they could be going up and down, up and down, up and down based on the market. So a lot of times when we did sell particular units we need to actually come up with an accounting methodology, methodology to determine which items we indeed sold. So there are various ways to do this. Um, before we go into the various ways, let me show you what an inventory subsidiary ledger looks like. So for every item that we actually have in our inventory, we're going to keep a separate subsidiary ledger. The separate subsidiary ledger lists out the details of the purchases and the sales of that particular unit. And then in the far right hand column of the subsidiary ledger, it's going to keep a running balance of what we have in inventory. So let's just take a look at this particular item. It's the Elco AC40. It's a portable generator. And you can see on the slide on January 5th, if you take a look at the slide here, January 5th, it looks like we purchased two units from our vendor. The vendor charged us $1,000 per unit. So we had $2,000 of inventory as of that date. If we go all the way to the far right hand side of this particular ledger, you can see that the balance right now is two units at 1,000 for a total of 2,000 units. And then on February 5th, we bought three additional units from our vendor. However, our purchase price increased. It went from $1,000 to $1,200 per unit. 
So 3 times 1,200 is 3,600. And if you come all the way across to the far right hand column, you can see that our balance and what we're going to do now is we're going to keep track of the layers of inventory. So after the February 5th purchase, we now have two layers of inventory. We have two at a thousand and now we have this second layer three at 1200. But if you do the math in total, our cost in our inventory account right now is $5,600, which is basically two at a thousand plus three at 1200. Okay, so those are the inventory layers. Here are the four options for costing. The first is called specific identification. The second is called average cost. The fourth is called FIFO, which is an acronym for first in, first out. And the fourth is called LIFO, last in, first out. Let's practice each of these. Okay, so as we saw, we purchased units on both uh, January and February. Now March comes along. On March 1st, our, um, we, we sell one of these generators to our customer. Our customer is called Boulder Construction Company. And the selling price is $1,800. And our inventory method is called specific identification. What this means is out of these five units that we have in stock, and remember two at a thousand and three at 1200, that means we're going to specifically identify which of those five units we are selling. Well, we happen to be selling one of the units from the $1,200 layer of inventory. I'm over here in the inventory balance, as you can see. So after selling that one unit, um, which cost us $1,200, now our new layers are, we still have the two at a thousand, but instead of having three at 1200, we now have two at 1200. So our running balance in the inventory is down to $4,400. Your two journal entries are going to be as follows. First, we need to record the sale, and that was for $1,800. So you can see we're debiting cash, and we're going to credit the sales revenue account. And our internal cost of that inventory was $1,200. So we're going to increase the cost of goods sold, which once again is just a fancy way of saying inventory expense. And we're going to reduce our inventory by the $1,200. So that is the first method. It is the, called the specific identification method, where we simply identify the exact model that we are taking. Okay, next. The next method is called the average cost method. With the average cost method, what we're going to do is we're going to take the average cost of the items that we purchased. And whenever we stop and we make a sale, we're going to take the average cost at that moment in time to reduce our inventory. So let's take a look. January 5th, we bought two items and they were $1,000 each. So at that time, our average cost is $1,000 per unit. But after we bought three more on February 5th for $1,200 each, do you remember the total cost was three times 1,200 or 3,600? So at this moment in time, we have a total inventory cost of 5,600. Well, the 5,600 was spent to buy five units. So our new average is 1,120. So when we sell the item on March 1st, the average cost of 1,120 is going to be used to reduce our inventory balance. So the first journal entry is exactly the same as we saw in the prior example, the specific identification, debit cash credit sales, but the dollar amount in the second journal entry is where it changes. We're going to debit cost of goods sold for the average cost at the time of the sale and credit inventory. The third method is called FIFO, first in, first out. So if we sell one unit on March 1st, 
The first items in are the first ones out to the customer. So think back. Do you remember on January 5th? That was our first items in. We bought two units at $1,000 each. So the one unit that we sold is going to come out of our inventory at $1,000. After, and here's our updated ledger balance after using FIFO, we did have after the February 5th entry, we had two layers of inventory, two at 1,000 and three at 1,200. Well, if we sold one of these $1,000 layers, now we only have one at 1,000 and three at 1,200. So be very mindful with your subsidiary ledgers. Now, keeping with the FIFO example, let's just say instead of selling one generator, we sold four. So out of the five that we purchased, we're selling four of them. Once again, first in are the first out to the customers. So which ones are out to the customers? We're going to go from the oldest layer and work forwards. So the two at 1,000 from the January purchased, they are sold. Now we move on to the next purchased. Two from the February 5th purchase at 1,200. So $4,400 is the cost of goods sold in that example. And now let's take you to the last methodology and that is called LIFO. LIFO is the opposite of FIFO. LIFO stands for last items in are the first ones out. So in this example, um, when we sold one item on March 1st, the last item in or the most recent item in is going to be the first one that we sold. So um, we're going to sell from the February 5th purchase. And that was, if you recall, $1,200. Here's the updated subsidiary ledger if we were using the LIFO account. So we had two layers of inventory, two at 1000 and three at 1200 Using LIFO, one of these three units is gone. So our new layers of inventory are two at 1000 and two at 1200 or $4,400. And second example using LIFO, if we sold four instead of just one. Once again, LIFO, the last items in or the most recent items in are the first ones out. So let me just go back so you can see it here. If we sold four of them, that means we would have sold all three of these last layer and one <coughs> of the oldest layer. <coughs> and so here is the um, amounts of what we sold. Once again, three. Basically, the entire February 5th purchase is gone. And one from the oldest layer of inventory is gone. Our cost of goods sold is 4600 And after this, we only have one item in inventory, and that would be from the January 5th purchase. All of them are acceptable. Um, you really should use um, the method that it best suits your organization. Um, example, specific identification is best suited for unique inventories. Um, the best example I can give you would be like a, um, a jeweler. All right. They sell certain diamonds and each inventory item that they have is very unique. So specific identification would work well with that. Average cost is when um, the items typically have the same accounting value. All right. It, it eliminates any manipulation uh, opportunities um, and it's, it's, it's really easy to calculate if the cost doesn't sway too much. FIFO, um, first in, first out, so during inflationary times, and we did see an example of that when I worked through some of the journal entries with you. During inflationary times, um, the cost of goods sold is going to be lower, which makes net income higher, and of course your tax bill higher as well. Um, and it's also going to make the inventory value on your balance sheet higher because the first items in are the first ones out, so the remaining items are the more expensive items and they would be on your balance sheet. Of course, um, higher profits are going to be higher taxes. LIFO, on the other hand, um, the good thing about it is obviously when we are reporting our cost of goods sold on our, on our income statement, it's going to be the current costs matching with current revenues. 
Um, there are going to be lower profits. There are also going to be lower income taxes. These are all, well, the lower income tax is a good thing. But here's the biggest beef, and this is why LIFO is not used that often. Um, the big con is what's left over on the balance sheet is really old stuff. And that's really not indicative of the replacement value. So we want to be very, very careful with using LIFO. Here's the summary of everything we talked about. The four methods, what the cost of goods sold would look like, and of course what the inventory on the balance sheet would look like. Um, here's the deal. You need to be consistent. So if you choose average cost, we need to use average cost every single year. If we choose FIFO, we need to use FIFO every year. The majority of companies are going to use FIFO because it basically, the flow of costs tend to go along with that. First items in are the first ones out. First items in are the first ones out. And the remaining items in inventory are their most recent purchases. I think that makes sense to most individuals. All right. Um, now, uh, at the, even if we're keeping track of our inventory um, perpetually, meaning every time there's physical movement, we're updating that inventory account, we still are going to stop and take a physical inventory, which means we're going to physically count the inventory at the end of every accounting period. That's at least once a year. And the reason we do that is because things break, things get stolen, things get lost. Uh, things get spoiled, whatever the case may be. These are called shrinkage losses. And the difference between the inventory on your balance sheet and the physical inventory that you're counting, we are going to assume it is an additional cost of goods sold. So for the difference between the physical count and the amount on the balance sheet, um, assuming the physical count is lower, we're going to debit the cost of goods sold and credit or reduce the inventory. That is going to get your balance sheet in line with what's physically in the warehouse. Um, in addition, we may need to write down our inventory. Write down basically means uh, reducing the value of the inventory on your balance sheet. We would need to do that because sometimes our inventory becomes obsolete or for whatever reason it's unable to be sold. If inventory does become obsolete, we are going to write down the value to, to if it's obsolete, write it down to zero or, or some sort of scrap value if we do have it. Um, if the market values have decreased, we're going to write it down to the market values or the resale values. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to utilize a concept called LCM to do this. LCM stands for the lower of cost or market. Market means current replacement cost. It doesn't mean the market of what we're going to sell it for. It means what could we replace it at. So we're going to prepare our inventory. And um, here's an example. We have um, ski equipment and we have ski accessories. Now, we can base LCM on individual product items or individual categories or the total inventory. So here's an example. Let's take downhill skis. Our cost on our balance sheet using FIFO is 16000 Now, if we were going to replace that today, it would cost 18000 The lower of the two is sixteen. Cross-country skis, right now on our balance sheet, it's a $4,000 cost. If we were going to replace them today, it would have been 3000 The lower of the two is 3000 So we can base the LCM based on individual items. We can also do it on the category. Total ski equipment. 20,000, the market value, basically the replacement cost is, is a little higher. So, so we're good. Let's, let's keep the inventory at 20,000. Or we can do it based on their total inventory, grand total. The, the FIFO cost right now is 29,000. If the market replacement value is 28,005, the lower of the two is 28,005. So we can base LCM based on individual items where it's going to be 26,500, where the inventory categories, we have two categories here, 27,500, or the total inventory, as we saw 
28,500. So LCM can be based on any of those three. Individual items, in inventory category, or total inventory. We're gonna write it down by debiting the cost of goods sold and crediting the inventory if we have to do that. Okay, sometimes at the end of the year, when we physically count our inventory, we have to be mindful of a couple of things. Sometimes we may have purchased items from our vendor and they did not necessarily physically get to us yet. Now, if the terms are FOB shipping point, that means it becomes our inventory when our vendor ships it to us. So even if it is in transit, we still have to include that in our year-end inventory counts. FOB destination means that title to that inventory does not become ours until it arrives at our destination. So we have to be very careful with year-end cutoffs. Um, in addition, same thing with uh, items that we sell to our customers. If we sell to our customers FOB shipping point, we're gonna record the sale as soon as we ship it. But if the terms are FOB destination, we can't record that sale and the and the and the um, the resulting reduction of inventory until our customer receives it. So if it's year end, December 31st, let's say it's a calendar year end, same as the accounting year. Um, if our customers didn't receive it until January 1st or 2nd or 3rd, even though it's physically not here and we sent it, sent it out, we cannot record that sale and the reduction of inventory until our customers receive it. Hence, even if it's not in the physical count, we need to include it in our ending inventory. So be very, very careful at the end of the year with these terms. It could really sway your inventory. Of course, we have movement of inventory between us and our vendor on one end. And of course, we have movement of inventory between us and our customer on the other end. Okay, so that was the first system using the perpetual inventory system. Now let me take you through the second method, and that is called the periodic inventory system. Now with the periodic inventory system, and I, I keep emphasizing that word periodic, this simply means that we are gonna update the inventory account on our balance sheet only one time an accounting period. Basically at the end of the accounting period when we physically count it, that's when we're gonna update the inventory account. So while we are purchasing the inventory, we're gonna debit this account called purchases. This is a temporary account that is only used during the year. It's basically gonna be part of the cost of goods sold, which I'll show you in a little bit. And we're going to credit accounts payable, all right, assuming we didn't pay for it just yet. Um, now we sell the inventory. And I am here to tell you when we sell the inventory, we are not gonna record any entry to increase or decrease inventory, but we will record the sale. This is completely different than the perpetual inventory system. If you recall with the perpetual inventory system, we recorded two journal entries when we sold the, um, the inventory. We record the reduction of the inventory. We also recorded the sale, but with the periodic system, you can see we're only recording the sale. All right, let's take a look at an example. So here is our example. So during the year, we started with a beginning inventory of this particular item, this SKU number, we had 10 units. And they cost us $80 per unit, and here's the extended cost. 10, 10 times 80 is 800. And then we bought more of this item on March 1st. We bought five items at $90. On July 1st, we bought five items at $100. On October 1st, we bought five items at $120. And lastly, on December 1st, we bought five items at $130. So we can see what we started with that's called beginning inventory <clears throat> plus what we added, the purchases. So beginning inventory plus purchases, that equals what is available for sale. There are 30 units available for sale and the extended cost of those 30 units are $3,000. So we have 30 units available for sale. So now the question is, did we sell all of them? Well, at the end of the year, we look in the warehouse and we count ending inventory of 12. So we had 30 available for sale 
yet 12 of them are still here in ending inventory, that means the difference is what was sold. Hopefully that makes logical sense to everybody. What was available for sale less what's still here in ending inventory equals what was sold. So 18 items were sold. And what we need to do using our specific identification, average cost, FIFO and LIFO, we need to put a dollar amount on the units in the ending inventory and the units sold using this information. All right, so first, specific identification. Once again, specific identification, we have to specify which of those 12 units are in ending inventory. So in this case, we're assuming that the 12 units in ending inventory has a cost of 1,240. So extending these to dollars, if we had $3,000 of inventory available for sale, but 1,240 is still here in ending inventory, that means 1,760 was sold. Hence the cost of goods sold. If it was average cost, we're going to take the average. So for the year, um, we spent $3,000 of getting the inventory to us. That would be the beginning inventory plus the purchases divided by 30 units. So our average is $100. So if we have 12, I'm sorry, let me go back. If we have 12 units in ending inventory, our cost of goods available for sale is $3,000 less $1,200 in ending inventory equals $1,800 is cost of goods sold. FIFO. Remember, FIFO stands for the first in is the first out. First items in are the first ones out. So go back to the original. How many units did we sell? Remember, we had 30 for sale and 12 were in ending inventory. That means we sold 18 items. Okay, 18 items, 12 are in ending inventory. So first items in, other first ones out. What's remaining? If we're using FIFO, the first items in are the first ones out. That means the remaining inventory of the most recent purchases. What was the most recent purchase? Five from the December 1st purchased, 130 each. And then we go to our next most recent purchase. Five from the October 1 purchase at 120 each. And then we go to our next most recent purchase until we get to 12. So five plus five and two from the July one purchase is still here. So our ending inventory is 1450. If our cost of goods available for sale was 3000 minus your ending inventory of 1450, that gives you cost of goods sold of 1550. And lastly, LIFO. LIFO stands for last in is the first out. That means your ending inventory, the oldest purchases. So we're gonna start from the oldest, which is the beginning inventory layer. And we had 10 in the beginning inventory. And then we go to our next oldest purchase. That would be the March 1st purchase. Um, two of those units are still here. Remember, we have, to, we have to cut it off at 12. And then we're doing so with that. That gets you to 980 as an ending inventory. So. Cost of goods available for sale, 3000 less what's still here in ending inventory. That will equal your cost of goods sold. So in this case, $2,020. So wanted to show you, you can use your four methods, specific identification, average cost, FIFO and LIFO using both the periodic method as well as the perpetual method. There are some significant differences between the two allowable methods. Before we get off the topic, I will tell you that the vast majority of companies now, because of technological advances, are going to use the perpetual inventory system. It is very common now for most individual um, retailers, if we're using retailers as an example, could be wholesalers as well, but they know where their inventory is at all times and they know their movement of inventory. Technology is allowing us to do this. So more and more and more companies are using perpetual inventory. And this slide here basically shows you that um, whatever, if we make an error at the end of the year, as an example, if we understate ending inventory when we physically count it, um, that means in the next year, the beginning inventory is understated. And because of that, what happens is 
over a two-year period, I'm not going to go through this whole thing with you, but over a two-year period, you are going to see that the error in one year is going to fix itself in the next year. So even though, as an example, let's take year one. We understated ending inventory. If ending inventory was understated, <coughs> that means cost of goods sold is overstated. If cost of goods sold is overstated, gross profit and net income are both understated. But the reverse is going to happen in year two. So even though the two years combined are, are each individual year is wrong, taking the two years combined is actually correct. The problem washes itself out, if you will. So just be mindful of that when you make errors in your physical counts at the end of the year. And let me just wrap this up by saying there are a couple of quick and I like to call them down and dirty methods to try to estimate inventory levels. This has nothing to, this has not um, a way to um, um, get away with uh, not doing the perpetual or periodic method. You still have to do that. But if you want a quick way to estimate inventory, you could do so. <coughs> the first method is called the gross profit method. And basically, we're going to take our gross profit rate um, to utilize it to help figure out our ending inventory. So here's an example. Metro Hardware, they had a beginning inventory of 50000 During the year, they per or I should say during the month of January, they purchased an additional 20000 of inventory. Um, their net sales are $30,000. So if the profit rate, gross profit rate is 40%, what is my estimated January 31st inventory? Well, we said the beginning inventory was 50. We purchased 20, so our uh, goods available for sale are 70,000. But we're trying to figure out we're trying to figure out a quick way to figure out what our ending inventory is. Well, if I know my sales are $30,000 and my cost is 60%, right? Because our gross profit rate is 40%. That means your cost is 60%. So 60% of 30, that is going to be your cost, your cost of goods sold. All right, $18,000. Cost of goods available for sale um, and your, your ending inventory um, cost is $18,000. Um, I'm sorry, your cost of goods sold is $18,000. That means available for sale of 70 and your ending inventory is 52, that gets you to the ending cost of goods sold of 18,000. All right, so you're basically using your gross, mof, gross profit percentage to help you back into what the ending inventory would be. You can also use a method called the retail method. Here's the example here, Ski Valley. They had inventory offered for sale at a million dollars. That would be the, the gross retail price. Our cost is 450000 Now, if the ending inventory has a total retail value of 300000 what would be the cost of that ending inventory? Well, what we see here is um, that $450,000 of inventory, um, base, that's at the cost. At retail, it was a million. So what is our cost ratio? It's 45%. So if our ending inventory is $300,000 at retail value, if we take that, multiply it by 45%, we see that our cost of our ending inventory is $135,000. All right, so that's a little bit of uh, inventory. This is the second full chapter dealing with inventory. As you recall, we had a prior chapter dealing with inventory. This really drives it home for the accounting of, of buying and selling inventory.